Member for Forestfield. Mr Deputy Speaker, thank you. And can I congratulate you on the election to your position and also the Speaker on the election to his position in, in this House. I also thank the clerk, the deputy clerk, and all of the support services here in the House who have been outstanding in their support and assistance to myself and all of the new members. It is with a great deal of pride and humility I stand here before you today as the proud member of Forestfield, in this the 40th Parliament of Western Australia, as a proud member of the McGowan Labor Government, and as a proud member of the Australian Workers' Union. Mrs Deputy Speaker, the magnitude of the honour, the privilege and the trust the electors of Forestfield have bestowed on me will not be forgotten and never taken for granted. I promise to do my best for them all of the time. Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wajak Noongar people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. Aboriginal people were first recorded in the Forestfield electorate area at the time of colonisation in 1929. The Bilu people inhabited the area in which, is, which the Shire of Kalamunda is now located and were a subgroup of the Wajak people. According to the Kalamunda Library Services and researchers Carol Mansfield and Marcia Ma, the Bilu lands covered an enormous area which was bounded by the Canning River on the south, Melville Waters on the west and by the Swan and Allen Brooks on the north. The eastern boundary was a bit harder to ascertain as it seemed the tribe liked to traverse the ranges looking for food and to get out of the wet and they moved to the much drier east as far as present day York or Beverly. I thank them for their custodianship of the land. Mr Deputy Speaker, I was born in Bunbury and moved to Harvey, a small southwest town about two hours from here, when I was five months old. I was the youngest of four children to Margaret and Darrell. Originally dad, his brother and father ran and owned Price Motors, the Holden dealership in Harvey. After a number of years, dad left the dealership and he and mum took on the Harvey News Agency, which they ran for about 15 years. Due to some health challenges dad had, they sold the news agency and took on a less onerous role as the proprietors of the Harvey Health Food Shop, which they ran until they retired. Unfortunately, my dad passed away just before the election this year, but I'm joined today by my mum, Margaret, my brother, David, my sister, Jane, and unfortunately, my other sister, Amanda, was unable to make it. Thank you, mum and dad, for everything. You taught me the values I have today and brought me up to be the person I am. I miss you, dad. After attending Harvey Primary School and Harvey High School, I completed my secondary schooling at Bunbury Catholic College. This was followed by a stint at university, which didn't quite work out as planned, and after a number of years I left. This at the time seemed like a good thing to do. However, reality doesn't take long to kick in, and when you're looking for a job and you don't have many skills to get you to get one. Fortunately, a friend was able to help me get a start on a gold mine as a fly-in, fly-out worker. This was an extraordinary opportunity, which has led to a sequence of events, which has brought me here today to stand before you. At that time, it was very difficult to obtain work within the mining industry. Fly-in, fly-out work was even more unusual, and gold was only 400 US dollars an ounce. <laughs> Working at that mine allowed me to pick up some valuable skills and experience, which enabled me to take advantage of future employment opportunities. Two life-changing occurrences also happened at that mine. It's where I first became a member of the Australian Workers' Union, and it's where I met my wife, Melanie. I left that mine after nearly five years, trying to get a job back in the city. I went to another gold mine for a while, and then in 1995, I was able to secure a job at an aluminum refinery just out of Yarloop. There, I worked as a rigger crane driver on a maintenance crew in an area of what is known as OC2. I also became more involved in the union on site. It was here as a delegate, then a senior delegate, and finally as, site, as a site convener 
that I learned the true benefit of being part of the union movement. It was also here, during the AWU elections of 2005, I first met Bill Shorten, then National Secretary of the AWU, and a young national organiser by the name of Paul Howes. After watching and being involved with Bill and Paul over the following years, as they reinvigorated and reunited the AWU, it was with a sense of anticipation and excitement that I made the approach to work for the AWU WA branch. After 12 years at the refinery, I left at the end of 2006 to start as an organiser for the union in January 2007. I was privileged to be appointed as the Assistant Secretary in December 2007 and then as the Secretary in July 2008. I remained as Secretary of the Union until I was pre-selected, after which time I stepped down to enable a smooth transition for the new leadership team and allow time for Mike Zutbrid to establish himself as the new Secretary. This also allowed me to concentrate on the upcoming campaign. As with any campaign, it is a team effort, and I had one of the best teams going. I would like to thank wholeheartedly Marie Liao, who was my campaign manager. Thank you, Marie. Without you, I'm sure I would not be standing here today. I was the beneficiary of your wisdom, your experience, and your strategic thinking. You had a campaign plan which we stuck to, and the results speak for itself. Without the constant support and guidance of my good friend and campaign director, Senator Glenn Stirl, I would not have been able to undertake the campaign that I did. Stirley, you are one of the best. Thank you for everything, not only over the last 12 months, but for the decade before that as well. Your continued support and mentoring is something I will always treasure. To the rest of my incredible team, I would like to put on the record my eternal gratitude, thanks and appreciation to the following people. Fiona Stell, Karen Newby, Cheryl Potcura, Ben Holigan, Joseph Kreese, Peter Brisbane, and Sean Hawkes. Thank you also to Terry and Kamala Izard, Jeff Madigan, Alethea Rasper, Chris DeMonte, and Molly Belmiers. A special thanks also goes to my now staff, Natalie and Peter. Thank you for your patience, commitment, and understanding as well. To the many, many volunteers, party members, union members and community members who helped on the Forestfield campaign. Thank you, thank you and thank you again. I could not have done this without all of you. Thank you also has to go to my now parliamentary colleagues, both state and federal, and to Patrick Gorman and Alendra O'Shalom and everyone at the party office. I wouldn't have been able to do this without all of your help. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would also like to acknowledge the unwavering support from the AWU, both state and nationally. Mike Zutbrid, Brad Gandy and the AWU WA branch, thank you for your constant encouragement, support and belief. To Daniel Walton and Misha Zielinski, National Secretary and National Assistant Secretary respectively of the AWU, and it's great to have Mish in the gallery this afternoon. Thank you for everything. To previous National Secretaries, Scott McDyne, Paul Howes and Bill Shorten. Thank you. None of this would have been possible without your encouragement, guidance and support over the years. And to my good friends and other AWU State Secretaries, Ben Swan, Ben Davis, Ian Wakefield, Peter Lamps and the New South Wales trio of Russ Collison, Wayne Phillips and Richard Downey. Thank you all for your continued friendship and advice. I must also record my thanks to all of the unions who helped out not only on my campaign, but on all of the campaigns, and especially to the Use Your Power campaign by the ASU and the ETU. In particular, I say thank you to Mike and the AWU, Peter O'Keefe and the SDA, Tim Dawson and the TWU, Christy Kane and the MUA, Mick Buchan and the CFMEU, Wayne Woods, Les McLaughlin, Steve McCartney, Carolyn Smith, and to their respective unions. Thank you. Prior to the seat of Forestfield being established in the 2005 redistribution, it was part of the Midland, Belmont and now Thornley electorates. It is home to over 27,000 people and is made up of three distinct areas, interwoven with various forms of industry and semi-rural properties. You have High Wycombe and Maida Vale in the north, Forestfield and Wattle Grove in the centre, 
and Orange Grove, Kenwheat, with parts of Maddington in the south. This is the third election for the seat of Forestfield, and on each occasion there has been a change in local member. I certainly intend to stop this trend. <laughs> the voting intentions of the Forestfield electorate are very clear. I would be a very unwise member not to learn from the hard lessons learnt by those before me over those elections. Can I also acknowledge the former members of Forestfield, Nathan Morton, and the member before him, Andrew Waddell, the current president of the Shire of Kalamunda. Located on the foothills, the Forestfield electorate is the gateway to the hills region, including Kalamunda, Lesmerty and Pickering Brook, and also the Swan Valley region to the north. With rapid growth and development in suburbs such as Waddle Grove, Forestfield, High Wickham and Matervale, the electorate of Forestfield has a very big and bright future. It's just a shame that parts of the electorate can't even access ADSL1, let alone the NBN. I will continue to work with the Shire of Kalamunda and the City of Gosnells to ensure development within, within the areas of Maddington and Kenwick within the electorate continues. I will strongly advocate for continued government investment in vital infrastructure projects to enable the future redevelopment with these areas which will also allow for the creation of future employment opportunities. Mr Deputy Speaker, a significant number of constituents raised with me issues regarding policing during the election. During the campaign, I committed to extending the opening hours of the Forestfield Police Station until 7pm. And I'm pleased to confirm that the Forestfield Police Station has been open until 7pm as from last Monday, the 8th of May. I realise issues in policing are not only a forest field one, and I'm pleased that the McGowan government has a comprehensive plan to tackle some of our most immediate policing challenges. The Forestfield Airport Link is a significant piece of infrastructure for the state and for the electorate of Forestfield. We have the opportunity to plan for the future development and infrastructure needs of the adjacent area to take maximum advantage of future development potential. This project will allow the establishment of new residential and retail developments, and the development fits perfectly into the WA Labor Metro Hubs proposal, and will enable the establishment of next generation industries and create local jobs for local people. We have to take advantage of its location in relation to the opportunities associated with becoming a major logistics hub to service the aviation, transport, and surrounding industries into the future. We need to ensure that training opportunities and facilities are central to this development. This is the pathway to employability for local residents. And this approach needs to be supported through improved educational opportunities resulting from increased resources being made available to local schools. I would also like to make mention of a few very important local groups. The Lot 20 Adelaide Street Awareness Group, the Forestfield Information and Referral Service, also known as FERS, and the Friends of Brixton Street Wetlands. Adelaide Street in High Wycombe is a very unique street for all the wrong reasons. The residents on Adelaide Street and within the surrounding neighbourhood of Jacaranda Springs are caught up in a terrible set of circumstances regarding planning, development and environmental issues. I will continue to advocate and work with the group with the aim of achieving a satisfactory outcome for them. FERS provides a number of vital services to the people in the Forestfield electorate who are in desperate need of assistance. It is also a platform for many community groups and playgroups to operate within the area, bringing the diverse community of the electorate together. Unfortunately, FERS has some significant financial challenges ahead of it, and sometimes biggest isn't always best and I will continue to fight to maintain this very local, uh, very important local service. The Friends of Brixton Street Wetlands perform an amazing role in protecting and re-establishing this globally unique wetlands in Kenwick. Their work in ensuring this area is revegetated and cared for is amazing and I will continue to support them in any way I can. My previous role as Secretary of the AWU allowed me a unique insight into the challenges confronting the state's economy and the working people of Western Australia. In my view, the current attack on penalty rates is one of the biggest challenges we'll see on workers in this country. The fact that only a small group of workers have been singled out as inferior to others and therefore deserve a lesser penalty rate 
is disgraceful. The point I need to stress here, and to make sure every working people, every person understands, is this will affect everyone, and most importantly of all, it will affect our children. The 1st of July 2017 is when these cuts are meant to start to take effect, and it is a Saturday. And as sure as night follows day, when you walk into your local coffee shop on Sunday morning, July 2, there will not be extra staff employed to serve you because penalty rates have been cut. Your skinny decaf soy latte will not be any cheaper because penalty rates have been cut. You won't even notice the change unless you are the person serving that skinny decaf soy latte and you have had your penalty rates cut. Mr Deputy Speaker, can I seek an extension of time, please? Extension granted. Thank you. You might be one of these people who think that cutting penalty rates does not impact on you because you're on a contract or an annualised salary. Well, if that's you, you are wrong. You may not physically be able to see it on your payslip, but an amount for penalty rates would have been included in the overall construction of your salary total. The attack on hospitality and some retail workers is only the first salvo. We need to do what we can to protect penalty rates. This is not the end game, this is only the beginning. The end game is to get rid of penalty rates, full stop. Another area that we need to focus on and ensure there is an improvement in, in support and resources is workplace occupational health and safety and focusing on workplace deaths. Occupational health and safety in WA workplaces is very complicated. You have Department of Resource Safety that is responsible for resource sector workplaces. You have Energy Safe who is responsible for the technical and safety regulation of all the electrical and most of the gas industry. You have the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority who is responsible for safety in the offshore industry in Commonwealth waters. You have the Office of the National Rail Safety Regulator who is responsible for safety on railways. You have the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, who is responsible for safety in the maritime industry. And you have WorkSafe, who are responsible, essentially, for all other workplaces. Mr. Mr. Ms. Deputy Speaker. Just Deputy Speaker will do. Thank you. Uh, on average, a West Australian worker is killed every 19 days. This is according to a WorkSafe report released in September 2016. And the report states, 19 days is the average number of days a person is fatally injured in a workplace in Western Australia based on the five-year period from 2011-12 to 2015-16. 19 days. One death in a workplace is one death too many. One injury on a workplace is one too many. Every worker has the right to go home from work uninjured every day. Every worker has a responsibility to ensure they work safely and every employer has a responsibility, to, a responsibility to ensure they provide a safe place of employment. If this does not occur, however, then an employer can hide behind the legal protections of the company they work for. This is wrong, and our laws need to change to allow for industrial manslaughter legislation to be introduced. A number of the agencies responsible for oh and in WA have different jurisdiction pow jurisdictional powers, and we have to continue to ensure we have the best safety laws in Australia here in West Australian workplaces through these agencies continuing to work together. There has been a lot of work undertaken previously in regards to harmonisation and the National Mine Safety Framework. And this work needs to continue. This is not about lowering the safety standards of workplaces in, this, in Western Australia, but about ensuring consistency and the highest level of safety requirements in a workplace. Essential to providing safe workplaces in WA is ensuring that the regulators are adequately funded and resourced, ensuring we protect the right of the worker to refuse to do a task if they think there is an imminent risk to their personal safety, and ensuring the ability for unions to access a site for safety investigations or to represent a worker in a safety-related issue or after a workplace accident. As I stand here tonight and look around our side of the chamber, I wish to congratulate all of the new and re-elected members and want to draw your attention to the number of female members who were elected. This is a fabulous outcome for the people of Western Australia 
and credit needs to be given to the WA Labor Party and our affirmative action policy. Yeah. People have been critical of having gender policies or female quotas previously. They are right. We should not need to have them. But when the willingness to change is less than committed, it certainly ensures there are improvements and actions speak so much louder than words. As a father of four daughters, gender equality is something that is dear to my heart. It is disgraceful that Western Australia has the highest gender imbalance in Australia when it comes to wages. There is no acceptable reason for this. WA continues to have the worst gender pay gap in the nation, with women earning around 24% less than men, compared to that really good average of only 60% less across the nation. This is not good enough, and this is why we need to have strong policies and legislation to ensure gender equality and to drive that change. The issues that could lead to workplace gender disparity are not new, and all of them can and should be addressed. We need to ensure that women can maximise their earning potential and, and can return to the workforce. And we must ensure that there are family-friendly employment arrangements and flexibilities in place to facilitate this and that every person is paid appropriately. We must ensure that our daughters can aim for the sky. I have saved my final thanks for my wife, Melanie, and our four beautiful daughters. Abby, Erin, Rani and Tia. I'm extremely fortunate to have the family I have and without their unwavering love, belief and support, none of this would have been possible. To Mel, our girls, and everyone who has supported me and to all of the people in the Forestfield electorate, thank you. I will not take your trust and belief in me for granted and I will always work as hard as I can in your interest in order to repay the faith you have shown in me. Thank you.